Our New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter, the 14th through the 30th verse. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place in the spirit where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. There was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except the widow of Zarephath and Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. My friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, speak to us now through these ancient texts. Open our hearts and minds to what it is you have for us to hear. And Lord, equip us to be your ambassadors in the places where we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I begin, two brief comments. Number one is I was privileged to be here last week for the celebration of the ministry of Heather Schoen Wolf. And I want to commend you all and say thank you to all who were part of that. I've been doing this work of working with pastors and congregations in transition for eight years now. And the thing that I say every time is the first step in a good transition is a good goodbye. And last week was indeed a good goodbye. So thank you to East Liberty Presbyterian Church for your work in sending her off. The second is to, uh, to commend the work of your PNC. Uh, I did not know how much work was involved in being on a PNC until 1991, when I joked that I didn't see my father for a year and a half. It was because he was on a PNC. Uh, and uh, I, I saw as a young child the amount of work he did going into that. The reading of countless documents and listening to cassette tape sermons and, and the diligent work that they did. And I want to commend to you the work of your PNC. They have worked hard over these last months discerning and listening uh, for the leader who they believe God is calling to you, who you will get a chance to meet this weekend. Be in prayer for them. Be in prayer for the PNC. And I am excited about what is next for East Liberty Presbyterian Church. The old adage goes like this. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Often credited to Will Rogers, it's one of those statements that parents and teachers would often use. Really, it's just a variant of the other thing my mother would say to me, behave yourself, but it sounds a little bit different and therefore might be heard a little bit different. And the phrase feels, well, a little shallow. And perhaps it is, but it's not wrong. The truth is, people, us rely heavily on our instincts, and no matter how hard we try, we will biologically form a first impression 
when we meet someone new. Most of you will know why I chose this topic for this day, but if this happens to be your first Sunday at East Liberty Presbyterian Church, you have already heard that there is a momentous day in the life of this congregation coming next week when the individual nominated by the PNC will stand here and preach and then be voted on by the congregation. So yes, my sermon ostensibly is about the importance of first impressions and how we understand them, but to be honest, it's about more than that. It's about human relationships. It's about learning from this narrative and this story and listening for how God is speaking to us this day about this story. It's a story that has lessons for us, ancient lessons that we can glean wisdom for today. And why I think this is so important is it seems, and I stress seems because I am very, very skeptical when people say, oh, it's never been worse than it is right now. But, when it, but in a time when it seems as relationships are strained, often over political and social issues, that maybe it wouldn't hurt us to do some reflection upon what it is that helps us be in good and right relationship with one another. For our passage today, we turn to Luke 4. Now, the Gospel of Luke is an interesting one. It records the most information about Jesus' childhood. But by Luke 4, the ministry has begun. Jesus has been baptized, and he is returning home after his first, quote, tour of ministry, we might say. And he goes to the synagogue, and there's a key phrase here, as was his custom. The text is very clear. This was Jesus' home synagogue. This is a place where he would be known and recognized, a community that likely helped raise him and celebrate with him the rites of passage as a Palestinian Jew in the first century. These were his people, and he was one of them. And he gets up and stands and reads again. The text tells us this was custom. And then the whole place falls silent. You see, they had heard about what this hometown kid had been up to. They had heard the stories of the ministry that he had done. And there's a tension in the text that says people were just waiting for what would happen next. Everyone was impressed. They began saying things like, hey, is this, isn't this Joseph's kid? Things are going well. You know the phrase, quit while you're ahead? Jesus decides to do the opposite of quitting while he is ahead. Instead, he decides to go right at him. Jesus suspects rightfully that what is about to happen is they will begin to, to challenge him, to say, hey, hey, uh, Jesus, we heard you did some pretty cool stuff over in Capernaum. Why don't you show us some of those miracles, huh? Rather than wait for the challenge, he decides to start throwing darts. And he basically says, look, I'm not going to do that, and here's why. Because even if I did, you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe a prophet is only without honor in their hometown. And then, to drive the point home, he decides to liken them to a time in Israel's past, two times, in which there was not much good happening within the nation of Israel, but good things were happening outside the nation of Israel to non-Jews. He basically says, look, I'm not going to do what you want me to do because you are nothing, nothing better than the faithless ancestors that have come before you. Shockingly, they did not take this well. And they run him out of town. Now, there's one thing I have to say at the beginning. Should Jesus have quit while he was ahead? No. Jesus was a prophet. His job was not to make people happy and comfortable. His job was to irritate them and job well done. But I think there are things that we can learn, not from Jesus' model, but from those of his listeners. And as I see it, they made two critical mistakes. The first is this. They had an impression of Jesus that they would not let go of. 
We all make first impressions. Now, if you are at all skilled and knowledgeable in the area of neuroscience, you're going to want to just kind of, of hold on for the next 30 seconds as I completely butcher your field of study doing my best. So here we go. As I understand it, as I understand it, humans are hardwired within our instincts to seek out our safety. And when we encounter someone new, part of our brain is going, is this safe, is this safe, is this safe, is this safe? It's part of what keeps us safe. That's also the part that causes us to form first impressions of people. Forming first impressions is not actually the problem. The problem is we don't allow those first impressions to change. I have done youth ministry for a long time. My oldest youth group kids are now in their mid-30s. And what I have learned, sometimes the hard way, is your first impression of someone needs to be as flexible and malleable as Play-Doh. Because people change, and you change. And over time, the impression, the box, the understanding we have of someone needs to flex and change. If you have raised a kid, if you have been around a kid, you have seen this firsthand. My three-year-old and my 17-year-old are biologically the same person, and that is about the only similarity left. Our initial impressions, our understanding of people needs to flex. And in, Jesus, and in this audience's case, they couldn't do it. They had this idea of Joseph's kid. That's even how they refer to him, is Joseph's kid. This is Joseph's kid. Who is he to tell us that? This is Joseph's kid. What's he doing? Ah. See, they liked him when they were proud of him. The hometown kid. The kid from Nazareth. You see, Nazareth, it wasn't a place to be from. Even Jesus' disciples were suspicious that anything good could come from Nazareth. So at first, they were proud of him. Hey, this is the hometown kid. He's done us proud. He's got a good reputation. And then when he starts throwing darts, they say, oh, no, uh-uh, you stay in your lane. We as followers of Jesus, need to learn to have flexible understandings of people. To allow our first impressions to be changed, malleable, flexed over time. I think one of the great challenges in human relationships is to allow our view, our understanding of someone to change as they change and as we change. So lesson one, learn from the audience. Make your first impressions but hold on to them loosely. Second mistake I see is that they heard certain words and they assumed that, that they understood what he was saying because he was using words that they knew. Jesus uses words like kingdom, fulfilled, prophecy. And in each of their cases, they're thinking, oh, we know what that means. But they didn't. For some background. In the first century, the people of Israel, the Jewish Hebrew people, were oppressed. They were under the authority of the Roman Empire. And they had pretty much been that way for at least 600 or so years at this point. And there was an understanding, a philosophy within first century Judaism, that when the Messiah, the Deliverer, would come, they would be a son of King David. And to be a son of King David means to be a king, a political leader, who would defeat the powers of Rome and return the nation of Israel to its glory days of 700 or so years before. Now, let's be very clear. Jesus was political, but he was no politician. A politician does not start throwing darts in their hometown the way Jesus did. Jesus was political, but not a politician. But see, that was the problem. People expected Jesus the politician. They expected Jesus to be a political leader, not someone trying to start a movement to change the world. And we see this struggle throughout the whole of Jesus' ministry. Every time he's somewhere, people have this idea of this is what he's going to be and do. And then when he doesn't do it, it causes conflict. You see, he's using words and they are bringing their prior understandings and their interpretive lenses to those words. Now, as I said, the first one, holding on to first impressions loosely, doing youth ministry for as many years as I did, I learned that one pretty good. And I give myself okay marks on that. This one, 
not so good. This is not my area of strength at all. I am a very low context communicator. I sent my own mother photos last night that she had no idea what they were. And did I include any explanatory text? Of course not. Low context communication coupled with a mind that is always running at a thousand miles an hour and I am always assuming that I understand what a person is saying. At my best, I, ask, I say things like this. Tell me what you mean when you say the word. Or let me make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Or I hear you saying that you feel. But that's at my best. And I don't know about you, I'm not always at my best. And when I'm not at my best, I'm overanalyzing, making all kinds of assumptions, and I become needlessly argumentative with people because I'm not actually listening to what they're saying. Welcome to parenting two teenagers, by the way. This is the challenge that we have, is to make sure that we understand what someone is saying when they're using words that we know. In this case, in this case, this is the core misunderstanding. Jesus comes in and says, hello, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy from Isaiah. And they go, interesting, tell us more, but you all are going to miss out because you are hard-hearted like your ancestors were. Instead of listening and seeing this, seeing Jesus as a rabbi who wanted to lead them to start a movement to change the world and to make right the wrongs, they saw him as a political leader, denouncing them. So much of this story goes wrong because the expectations around initial impressions and communication go south. When I was an uh, aspiring seminarian, I was 22 years old, I spent the summer at a church in Colorado. And the pastor of this 600-member church was an 83-year-old man named George Moore. He had signed on to be the parish associate 10 hours a week, and then the pastor and the associate pastor both left. And being Western Colorado, where well, there's 12 churches in half the state, the interim responsibilities fell to him. And one day, George and I were sitting going over my sermon for that coming Sunday. And he sat back in his chair and with his Western North Carolina accent that I won't at all try and imitate, he goes, boy, you're going to get to meddling in his sermon. And I was like, oh, I, 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 but Pastor George, he goes, no, 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 listen to me. He says, there's nothing wrong with meddling. Just tell people that you're going to meddle before you do it. Do warning. This is my meddling part of the sermon. As I mentioned at the beginning, this next weekend's a big weekend for you all, as you will meet the individual nominated by your PNC to serve as the next pastor. And that is a really, really big deal. And I have little doubt, in fact, I have no doubt at all, that next week's sermon will go better than Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth, but that is admittedly a very low bar. But I want to share something with you, and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. The individual that has been, been identified by your PNC is not going to be like Randy, or Heather, or Patrice, or BJ, or Bob Chestnut. The individual identified by your PNC won't preach the same, they won't lead the same, they won't provide pastoral care the same. They will use words that you think you understand, but they may not mean them in the same way. In short, they're going to be different. Now, different is good, yes, but different can be hard and challenging, particularly for Presbyterians. And the truth is, and I mean this with all love and sincerity, the truth is that even those who are the most dedicated to progressive, social and theological causes can sometimes struggle with what is new and unfamiliar. My hope and prayer is simply this, that you as you receive and meet the candidate and God willing, they begin their time as your next pastor, that you would learn these lessons from Jesus' first audience, 
that you will allow the initial impression you have that you will form to be changed and to be challenged and that you will make sure that as you listen you understand what they mean to say. And while that is true for your interactions with, again, God willing, your next pastor, I think it's broader than that. You see, the sum of Jesus' ministry is this, love God and love others. It is very simple, but it is not easy. And yet I think this story, this simple story of a first sermon gone tragically wrong can teach us two things. That if we're going to do that second part, that if we're going to love people well, and by doing that, fulfill the first part by loving the image of God in them, I think these two things, of taking your initial impression and holding it loosely, and listening well, can go a long way toward helping us be the faithful disciples that Jesus calls us to be. As we seek to love everyone, even those we don't like, as we seek to love everyone in the way that Jesus loves 